and next <coughs> moving to orogenic or mountain forming movements we have seen how mountains are formed that is compression from two direction will re give rise to mountain uh, folds which are mountains and these forces takes place years um, uh, few million years to happen so these are under, these are forces under diastrophism that is slow force slow movement of earth's crust and we have seen what are synclines and anti synclines and there is other kind of mountains called as fault blo fault, fault block mountains which are example for usually sudden movements so we'll see them later so there are two forces one is tension and compression usually tension gives rise to mountains whereas the com sorry tensions give rise to fr fractures or fissures these are cracks in the earth's surface whereas compression gives gives rise to fold mountains so this is for a better understanding so these movement movements act tangentially tangential to the earth's surface we have seen what is a tangent so if this is the circle then the ones line that is perpendicular to the radius would be the tangent so the forces acting that is the orogenic forces are tangential forces that is both ten tension and compression acts along the surface so we can see here three different examples where we can see these two machines are pulling the block in such a case there is extension of the block and there would be a crack created in between then it would lead to a fracture or you can call that a fissure or crack and when same thing happens over a, over a block of landform then there would be two different kinds of landforms usually one is one where there are fractures other one where there is sliding of land usually when there is this kind of force acting away from the center then there will be there will be sliding of a block of land and this is called as a fault block and in other case there is compression acting on a landform in certain case there would be folding or if the whole block is moved then it would be called as a reverse fault in reverse fault a mass of land is uplifted so in a normal fault usually a mass of land is gets subsi uh, is sub it will subside whereas in a reverse fault it it gets uplifted whereas when there is twisting of a land or we can see shear twisting laterally then usually a landform would undergo fracturing just like this or if the whole block of land moves then it would be a fault which is called as transcurrent fault so this is just an example how forces can twist or fold a landform as well as slide a block of land so faulting and folding are two different aspects so these are examples of folding and the other three are examples for faulting so these two terms are very important in our study of geomorphology so now moving to sudden movements so till now we have seen about diastrophic movements which are slow movements which are part of endogenetic movements and the other kind of movements which are part of endogenetic movements are sudden movements one example is earthquake other one is volcano so in earthquake what we see is faulting so in mountain building process we saw folding now we here we see faulting so we we have seen when there are three blocks of landform let us imagine these are three blocks of landform and if these two blocks move away from each other that is when there is tension between these two blocks then the block in between would slide towards the bottom and this would create a normal fault and in another case when there is compression acting on the middle block that is when these two blocks are pushed to towards each other then there is upliftment of this block and this is called as reverse fault and in the same way when there are two faults two blocks and these blocks moves horizontally with respect to each other that is if this block moves horizontally then there is kind of fault formed between these two blocks which is called as transcurrent fault so all these kind of faults will lead to what earthquakes not every fault but when there is sudden slippage of land there will be earthquake waves created we have seen this in the previous video that uh, that is earth's interior so it would lead to a sudden movement called earthquake so volcanoes are nothing but violent outburst of magma when through a weak zone so in crust there are weak zones weak spots through which the magma can escape and this region gives rise to a volcano and even this movement is very sudden and in, hence it is called a sudden movement and all these movements have their forces coming from within the earth's surface hence they are called as endogenetic forces now we are finished talking about 
endogenetic forces that is the forces acting within the earth's crust and now we'll move on to exogenetic forces or the forces that are acting above the earth's crust and there are some forces which are coming from the earth's interior as well which influences endogenetic movements but the significant ones are the ones which are existing above the earth's surface and for our study of exogenetic forces we need to know the term denudation denudation is a term which keeps on occurring frequently in our books and denudation is simply a process where a process which involves all three processes of weathering erosion and deposition so exogenic processes derive their energy from atmosphere and the ultimate source is sun and under the influence of sun and the climatic factors there are these processes called weathering erosion and deposition that are occurring so weathering is nothing but a breakdown of rock into fragments over a period of time and all these fragments which are formed near the near the close regions of the rock are carried to a to a very far distance by the process of erosion and once the erosion is ceased there is deposition of these rocks and this is called as depositional process so all these processes come under denudation denudation is nothing but leveling of the earth surface by all these three forces so let us see a land consider a landform of this shape and now what happens due to denudation that is weathering erosion and deposition over a millions of years this landform would change into a landform which would look like this so it would look like a plateau so this process is mainly because of denudation so you must be clear what is denudation so next we'll see about what are the forces that help in denudation especially weathering so there are various forces acting within the body of a rock which are called as shear stress gravitational stress and molecular stress in shear stress usually the part of the rock would be subjected to forces which are trying to break the rock into pieces that are the internal forces which where the molecules are locked and these molecules the lock between these molecules is always weak due to shear stress or the stress from within the rock so when there is certain force or certain amount of external force applied to the rock then the shear stress would prevail and the rock would break into pieces and this is called uh, this is called as weathering under the influence of shear stress and the other one is gravitational stress where there is constant influence of gravity on this rock and so when a rock part of rock becomes weak and it is weak enough to pull be, to be pulled down by gravity that then even then this part of a rock will fall down to the ground and this is under gravitational stress and molecular stress is an example for internal stress so there is always force between two molecules usually the force between two molecules is locked with the help of a bond but when this bond could be overcome with an addition of external force and there will be breakage of bond and the the molecules get, will get separated Uh, so this is molecular stress mainly induced due to chemical actions and external he, uh, energy given through thermal processes so all these are uh, too much science is not important here just to understand the basic concepts so denudation would mainly involve three processes we have seen weathering mass movements or erosion and then deposition or erosion to, uh, together acting as uh, to, towards creating a landform so there are various forces acting at different stages usually weathering mainly comes under gravitational stress chemical stress and molecular stresses and then mass movements are the movement of these particles happen under the influence of gravity and then kinetic energy is where the particles are in motion this is erosion and usually the kinetic energy ceases and the particle becomes a static one and at this point it is deposition so now we'll move on to the core topic that is weathering we have seen that in endo exogenetic pro, uh, processes there are two important ones one is erosion and other one is weathering erosion will be de dealt in other separate video in this video we will study in detail about weathering so there are primarily three important types of weathering one is called mechanical weathering other one is chemical and then bio biological we'll see them in detail so in chemical weathering there are few, few important processes like carbonation hydration oxidation or redu and reduction so all these processes are mainly chemical changes in carbonation carbon dioxide reacts with, with water giving rise to carbonic acid and rocks are very susceptible to acids that is they are very vulnerable and acids can easily erode them or weather the rocks that is break down the rocks into pieces so 
but weathering is not a quick process it takes a lot of time so carbonic acid or weak acid can influence the breakdown of rock over a period of time so carbonation is an important process hydration is nothing but where water fills the gaps or frac uh, cracks in the rock and due to change a seasonal change in weather that is successive uh, sorry con uh, consecutive hot and cold weathers will influence the volume of this water and this will in induce stress in the rock and uh, under the influence of stress as well as certain chemical reactions in the presence of water the rocks will weather or they break down into pieces so this is under the influence of hydration so in oxidation and reduction in oxidation mainly we see the reaction happens in the presence of oxygen where the rock gets oxidized for example the best example is rocks with iron content iron usually in the presence of oxygen gets oxidized into iron oxide iron oxide is comparatively less stronger compared to iron and it is called rusting so iron oxide is very easy to be broken down and with the passage of time the rock will break into pieces due to oxidation so this oxidation happens with all the kinds of rocks but it is very quick with rocks having metals such as iron magnesium etc so under the reduction usually these process of both oxidation and reduction are irreversible for example iron can be converted into iron ox iron oxide but iron oxide cannot be reduced to iron so reduction means different in the absence of oxygen the iron oxide would undergo reactions and iron oxide which usually takes the form feo it might be feo2 fe uh, it's a chemical formula not important so in the reduction process usually oxygen is lost but there is different combination of metals that uh, iron that is that that is the result of reduction process that it is totally different different from the original iron so even here the iron is very weak and it is very vulnerable to weathering process so even oxidation and reduction are very important in chemical weathering so for example red color of iron upon reduction turns to greenish or bluish so we see how it gets worse with more reduction so rocks will be easily weathered under the influence of all these chemical factors next let us move on to biological weathering in biological weathering weathering takes place mainly under the influence of organisms so it is nothing but chemical and mechanical weathering which is aided by various organisms for example you can see a tree which has broken down the rock here so in biological weathering there are different process one is burrowing or where small rodents like rats squirrels etc dig small holes through the landform exposing the rocks inside to the water and air as a result there will be some chemical weathering happening as a result there will be breakdown of rocks within the earth's surface this is mainly due to under the influence of rodents so it is a part of biological weathering here we can see the rodents only act as the ones that are aiding the weathering whereas the main weathering process is chemical in nature likewise decaying plants will re release acids like carbonic acid we have seen how carbonic acid could break down rocks not just carbonic acid many other acids can easily break down rocks for example when a when a body decays it usually releases acids acids like carbonic acid sulfuric acid as, a, as well as nitric acid and these acids are usually low in concentration but these acids acids are having significant strength to break down or weather rocks and algae utilize mineral nutrients for growth and help in concentration of iron and magnesium oxides we have seen that iron and magnesium oxides are usually ones that weak weaken the rock because oxides are weaker compared to the original element and under the influence of plant roots there is breakdown of rocks this is an example for mechanical weathering which is induced by organisms so here we can see both chemical and mechanical uh, weathering which are mainly aided by biological organisms and there is one more important one called as physical and mechanical weathering in mechanical weathering all the changes are physical that is there is no uh, influence of chemical weathering although chemical biological and mechanical weathering are simultaneous processes acting on the same piece of rock but in mechanical weathering we'll see only the influence of heat that is the differential influence of heat which acts on rocks which will lead to their weathering process so the first example is exfoliation exfoliation as you can see in the picture is simply the discarding of layers of rock 
which are exposed to the sunlight or intense heat of sun. Usually what happens is during nights the temperature significantly falls whereas during daytime these rocks gets very hot under the influence of sun. This differential heating leads to uh, change in shape or volume of rocks. Usually when a volume of when a mass of rock is subjected to intense heat its size increases that is it grows in size and when it is cooled it reduces reduces in size this is due to contraction and expansion so this is basic physics lesson where we will study in 6th or 7th standard so this contraction and expansion will give rise to what separation of blocks from the mass of huge rock usually the outer layers are exposed to intense uh, heat changes whereas the inner layers are insulated by the heat changes as a result only the outer rocks uh, outer rocks would undergo expansion and contraction and they would simply get separated from the major block and this is called as exfoliation the same with block separation except that in block separation the rocks get deformed in uh, detached from the main rock in the form of blocks again it depends on topography for example you can see it is a high hilly region whereas this one is just a small hill kind of region and in granular disintegration mainly happens in sedimentary rocks we know that sedimentary rocks are the rocks which are formed by the amalga amalgamation of various rocks which are washed away by water so sedimentary rocks are usually very weak compared to the igneous rocks so these are igneous rocks we study them in detail later so sedimentary rocks being weaker would get detached in the form of uh, granules under the influence of wind water etc so this kind of disintegration is called as granular granular disintegration which is important in sedimentary rocks and in mass wasting the weathering process is mainly influenced by gravity usually those at the higher regions are always unstable that is even a small push can lead to breakdown of rocks or separation of rocks from the main block due to weight which is a resultant of gravity so when this rock are subjected to various forces due to uh, fluvial action or wind action they can break and fall to the earth or uh, fall to the ground under the influence of gravity and this is mass wasting and this is a very important process in uh, mechanical weathering and in glacial regions or cold regions there is frost wedging which is associated with shattering of rocks that is in frost wedging what happens is there is fractures in or cracks in rock where the uh, water gets settled in warm uh, warm climates or in summer climates and in winter all this water gets expanded uh, freezes and increases enormously in size you know that the volume of water is greatest when it is in the form of ice usually ice is formed at a temperature of about 4 to 0 degrees celsius so when in summers this water gets accumulated in fractures or small pores in the rock but in winter it enormous, enormously increases in size creating huge amount of stress in the rock and it would get it would help in detaching of rock particles that is shattering of rock and the rocks formed in this manner are having a very sharp edges so this shape of rocks is very important in glacial erosion usually coming to erosion glacial erosion is very significant and is very powerful compared to other other types of erosion this is because of fine edges or that that are in the form of knife so these edges are very sharp and they can easily erode huge amount of material with them so when there is a movement of glacier or a mass of ice then the mass of ice would move would carry these kind of rocks with them and these kind of rocks would simply grind the bottom layers cutting the layers very easily and the erosion here would be very significant so frost action is a very important process in weathering because it leads to various glacial landforms we'll study that in detail later and let us now look at effects of or sig and significances of weathering first let us see effects so weathering gives rise to various landforms like peneplain and then tors and isilbergs rather than saying landforms we can just say these are rock structures except the penny plane and this is ayers rock in australia this is known for uh, which is also famously known as a rock that changes colors actually it's an optical illusion but the surrounding regions is a vast plain which is mainly the end process of erosional process so at the last stages of erosion the the landform would be so Play, such a plane that there would be there would be no significant movement of water there would always be stagnation of water because the gradient is too low so this is the end stage of erosion and 
so erosion and weathering are important in creating these kind of landforms not just pen penny plain various other landforms are also formed due to weathering and erosion so weathering is not solely responsible for this but weathering is an important agent and in patination that is this is chemical weathering where the rock the color of the rock is changed to blue uh, greenish or some pinkish color this is mainly due to under the influence of chemical action and this is due to weathering and then there are structures like torch where they appear as if one rock is placed on the other these are mainly famous in south india because we see these kind of a uh, lot of these rocks in a lot of south indian regions so these kind of torch are also mainly due to weathering and erosional process so if you see this looks as if some people are manually put these rocks in this shape but but this is this is natural and is formed by weathering process and the isle bugs are mainly found in deserts so these are also rocks which are disintegrated under the influence of wind er, wind erosion so weathering is influenced by wind yeah so this is important effects of weathering and coming to significance the first important significance is weathering helps in soil formation so usually when the earth was found it was full of rocks after the solidification of volcanic magma but under the influence of weathering this rocks got disintegrated and the soils we see now are a resultant of weathering for example deccan traps were rocks uh, after their formation that is about uh, 40 to 50 million years ago and now we can see a rich cotton a black soil which is found in maharashtra and the surrounding regions is a direct resultant of weathering of this deccan trap rocks and weathering also helps in enrichment so weathering with the help of erosion and deposition usually changes the chemical nature of soils for example we can see in sedimentary rocks lot of mineral ores which are found in sedimentary rocks are mainly due to depositional process so when there is weathering of rocks with metallic content these metals would be carried away by water action that is due to erosion and they would get deposited in certain regions and this would lead to en enrichment of those regions usually erosion is a process which degrades a land land surface whereas deposition is a process which improves the quality of land so enrichment is mainly associated with deposition but the basic eroded material is mainly due to weathering so weathering also plays important role in enrichment of landforms so thanks for watching and if you like the video please subscribe to my channel and this is my blog poemastrand.org where you can find all the text files for my videos